Okay, thank you, Kimberly. Uh, and I want to thank Kimberly and my good buddy, Terry Smith, who didn't come to see me, but he's a good buddy anyway, uh, um, for inviting me. Uh, and, uh, and I want to thank you all for being here. I know outside is, a, is, is quite, quite a lot of competition to be outside, so thank you for being in here. So as Kimberly said, I'm going to talk about the emotional impact of, of graves. Um, although we're not going to have a group discussion here, I'm very happy to answer questions to reach around you here. as we go along. So if you have questions while I'm saying something, just let me know in some way, and then we'll have some time for uh, questions afterwards as well. But the more informal this will be, I think the better it will be for everybody. So let me tell you what I want to talk about. I want to talk about, first start off with some personal accounts from the literature about things that, that you and your family may experience on a daily basis. About the emotions and feelings that people with Graves' disease might experience. And then a little bit about um, differentiating these emotional feelings from true psychiatric disorders. And I think that's a very important thing because people may think that they have a major psychiatric disorder and it may be more of a reaction or a, a, a brief kind of uh, number of symptoms. So we'll see if we can distinguish that. Then a little bit about the treatment of both the symptoms and if you have a psychiatric disorder, about treatment of psychiatric disorders. And then finally, strategies for what I call wellness, independent of, of psychiatric problems. So this I got from a, uh, an article that talked a fair bit about patients' um, reactions. Uh, before I was diagnosed, I felt as though I was losing my mind. I couldn't get along well with others, and my marriage was affected. I would go to the family doctor, and he would say, this is normal for a working mother of three. I lost self-confidence and worried a lot. Case history, 40-year-old professional father of three young children who experienced several months of uh, rapid heart rate, heat loss, heat weight loss, heat intolerance, uh, and this person became rather irritable, pretty out of character for him, both in the workplace as well as at home. Um, he felt symptoms of anxiety, uh, which is not typical for this person. Continued to work and was fairly productive, although in retrospect his colleagues thought he was sort of hyper. Um, at his wife's urging, he had a workup and it was clear to his internist that he had Graves' disease. He was rather thyrotoxic. Uh, had a combination of beta blockers, which calmed down a lot of the, the immediate symptoms, then was put on antithyroid medication and ultimately had uh, radioactive iodine and with thyroid replacement. And done very well. Um, and although within a few months the thyroid levels were quote unquote normal, this person knew that that was not normal for him. And so with his endocrinologist decided to, to not just work by the numbers but work by how he felt uh, and he went into remission. And over the next few years there were periods of time when the person became a little more unhappy, a little more moody. Uh, usually his wife said, uh, you know, must be your thyroid, and indeed she was right, and needed several increases of thyroid medication. So obviously you know that this, this professional person is me. So this was done, uh, I, it was my 40th birthday present, was a diagnosis of, of Graves' disease. My wife, I'm not much of a traveler, but she made a big deal. We went down to Mexico and I was thyrotoxic. And it was like 130 degrees there and my heart rate was like 300. And, I had an absolutely miserable time, and, uh, but I've been very fortunate in not having almost any of the, the additional kinds of things that Dr. Wood mentioned and we'll talk about, which are really, you know, fairly prevalent. I've been very fortunate. But, um, but I do have a little bit more of an understanding about uh, what people go through. There's another account. In a lot of ways, my wife and I were fortunate. She was diagnosed with Graves after about nine months. And that sounds like a long time, but on a slide I'm going to show you, it's not so long in terms of how long it takes for people to be diagnosed. During that time, however, while I knew my wife loved me, she frequently, who, frequently who I was married was not my wife. One aspect was the mood swings, the unexpected outbursts of anger, the unexplainable crying. This took the most work for me to deal with emotionally. So this is not a disorder of just the individual, like many chronic medical illnesses. They affect families, they affect spouses, they affect children, and so it, it is a familial disease in that respect. So as I said, it's very important to try and distinguish between emotions or, or transient mood states 
and psychiatric disorders. So many mood and emotional symptoms are short-lived. And this happens whether or not you have Graves or any other medical illness. You react to certain things. You may react with sadness. You may react with worry. You may react with anxiety. It typically is related to something in your world, in your external world, in your social relationships, and it's usually time limited. You can manage it, it passes, the sadness passes, doesn't necessarily affect your work very much or your productivity. On the other hand, psychiatric disorders are almost always more long-lasting, they are not short-lived, they can be chronic, and most of the psychiatric diagnoses we have have time frames built into it. You don't call somebody having X unless the symptoms last for at least two weeks. So you don't call somebody Y until it lasts for six months. And so there, there really is a difference between something that's sustained and something that may be a reaction. And the reason that it's important to do this is that many medical illnesses can lead to symptoms that when you treat the medical illness like Graves, many of these symptoms sort of abate or disappear. And you don't want to say that somebody has a psychiatric illness when you treat the medical illness and the symptoms disappear. So, but that's not always so easy to do. I'm going to show you with some of the psychiatric illnesses that often can be mistaken for Graves how to try and distinguish between them. So I'm just sort of curious, and this will be just shouting out. So those of you who have Graves' disease, what kind of emotional states, emotional symptoms have you experienced? Anger. Anger. Sadness. Sadness. Irritability. 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 Panic. Panic. Impatience. Impatience. I'll tell you a cute story about impatience. So when I was diagnosed, I had a, um, a, 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 six, a six-year-old and three-year-old twins. Okay, and I was I'm generally mild-mannered and, and not too irritable. My wife tells this, this story that I was in, at, taking something out of the freezer, and the freezer was packed, and you know, it was, and the kid, one of the one or both of the twins came up behind me, and I was, and, and grabbed my legs, and, and I was startled because I was so, you know, irritable, and I took something from the freezer and I just threw it across the room. And this was so, I mean, you can't imagine how out of character that is for me. But that's, that's the kind of irritability that I think people experience. Okay, so, and, the, and I'm going to show you slides as if you had written them, because every one of those symptoms are part and parcel of what people may experience at some times during their graves. So, but before I do that, this is a survey done a number of years ago, but the, the data are still pretty, pretty much what it is. Most of the women who responded to this survey were women, and as you saw in the pediatric literature as well as adult, most people with graves are women. Uh, the average age in this, in this um, range was 48, and I'm not gonna say that that's middle age. Our, our speaker who rode the bike talked about being 35 being middle age. I consider myself middle age, and I'm twi almost twice that age. Um, now, 10% of people stated that they sought help within a month of the onset of symptoms. So they felt badly, they went and got help. 35% said that they waited more than six months. And that's not atypical. So people start to feel badly. They think it may pass. They don't know what it is. Maybe it's a reaction to something, and, and they wait. But then what's w most concerning on this slide is the last bullet. It said that 35% stated it was more than three months before they first sought treatment to receiving a diagnosis. So that's suffering a month, two, three months before you go see somebody seeing somebody and then still taking another three months. And again, I think part of that is because the symptoms often present um, in the emotional realm and, and depending who you go see, they may or may not have enough of a, what we call an index of suspicion to think it might be thyroid disease. So here are th mechanisms, if you will, not, not, not truly biological mechanisms, but what can explain these symptoms? Well. The thyroid abnormalities themselves, the ex excess thyroid hormone actually makes people feel bad. So it, it feels like an adrenaline rush, and that was part of the question that was asked earlier. It, the thyroid hormone itself increases heart rate, causes all of the things that you saw, and increased heart rate, um, feeling jittery are both manifestations of the thyroid disease, but in people without thyroid disease, they are markers of 
some kind of emotional dysregulation. So it's very hard at times to distinguish between those two. So that's one cause of the symptoms. Now the second may be that the emotions may be a reaction to having a medical illness, Graves' disease or any other medical illness. So people with heart disease have a lot of emotional problems secondary to knowing they have heart disease. People who have other kind of chronic diseases, it's what we call like a secondary depression. It means that the depression is secondary to having the medical illness. So that's another reason. And the third is that they're two totally independent phenomena. So that psychiatric illnesses, as I'll show you, are exceedingly common. It's estimated that maybe one-third of the population during their lifetime will have a psychiatric illness. So if psychiatric illness is that common and you have Graves' disease, a lot of people with Graves will have psychiatric illness independent of their Graves, maybe at the same time. Or maybe the Graves' disease made the psychiatric illness worse. It's well known that one of the key reasons for psychiatric illness is getting worse is stress of some kind. And the stress may be external stress. The stress may be the medical illness. So the medical illness may trigger a, um, a vulnerability to become depressed. So as I talk, you'll he try and, I'm going to try and get back to this point because I think it's very important to, because treatment obviously depends on which of these areas. If the treatment, if the symptoms are purely the result of the thyroid disease, you treat the thyroid disease, the symptoms go away. If the, treat if the symptoms are part of a psychiatric illness, you treat the thyroid disease, but the illness may continue. So this is the symptom list that you all talked about. So these are common symptoms. Crying, sleep problems, fatigue, decreased interest in sexual activity, slower thinking. This cluster clusters into depression or sadness. And you, this is your brooding again, Alex. The guy's hiding under the thing. And this can be long term. So people don't feel well. You know, they can go around with a lower mood, with less interest in activities. Uh, and again, this can be independent of a, of a thyroid disease or secondary to it. Then there's a cluster that we could sort of call for anxiety, where there's shakiness, anxiety, feeling anxious, worrying a lot, being easily started, startled, feeling hot, trouble having trouble breathing. Again, symptoms are major symptoms of anxiety disorders, as I'll show you in a, in a bit. Then there can be the feeling of hopelessness, feeling that you will never get well again, being less productive at work or at home, feeling overwhelmed, wanting to give up, try, having a hard time focusing, not being as productive as you like. And then as it was in one of the quotes, the mood swings. So feeling okay and then feeling terrible, crying spells, feeling a lot of energy all over the place, out of control, hard to find a center. And these are exceedingly common. And I didn't put percentages here, but in multiple surveys, uh, some of these were 80% of the people who were queried had them. Not every one of them. And, and people have one at one point of the disease, may go to another at another point of the disease. Some people may only have one cluster. So, and there's no way of predicting that. There's been a fair bit of controversy about cognitive function or, or ability to think, really. And during the, the high, when you're truly thyrotoxic, your thinking can be relatively impaired. Uh, and that's partly due to the attention, because your mind is going so quickly, your thoughts are racing, it's hard to focus. And when you can't focus, it's hard to, to feel that you're, being, you're thinking um, ap appropriately. But studies, when they look at actual giving paper pencil tests that measure cognitive ability to people with Graves, really have shown relatively little sustained cognitive impairment. So the impairment tends to be more of attention. Uh, and when you, the, that is taken care of by one of the medical therapies, the attention usually improves and the cognition improves. Uh, on, on small number of people, there can be some persistent kind of, of cognitive impairment, but again, that's relatively rare and, and, and not a major problem. Less, less frequently psych... Yes? Uh, on the, the cognitive impairment, does there seem to be any relation 
between the severity of the Graves disease and the amount of Parkinson's? Okay, the question was, are there, is there a relationship between the severity of the Graves and the amount of cognitive impairment? I'm not sure that studies have looked at it to that degree in terms of they usually take a group of people with thyroid disease and then test them without knowing where their thyroid functioning is at the moment, so it's hard to know. But I would think that the, the more symptomatic you are with the thyroid disease, the more your ability to focus and to attend to a cognitive test will be impaired. So in that case, it's likely that if your thoughts are racing and you're feeling horrible and you can't sit still and you can't pay attention, a paper and pencil test will reflect that. But it doesn't necessarily mean that your brain is, is affected more or that your ability to learn ultimately will be affected more. It means at that moment, you're just less able to focus. They have done that, and, and for the most part, if people attain becoming euthyroid, if they're asymptomatic, then their cognitive function is, is, is indistinguishable from people without graves. But there are not very many studies of people who have, you know, out of control, very difficult to treat graves and their cognitive function. I'm not aware of those. Okay, much less likely, there are other, you know, sort of very um, rare kinds of causes. There's something called apathetic hyperthyroidism, uh, mostly in older individuals, where you get a lot of depression and apathy, not caring about things. Um, but, but that's, and, and so you have symptoms like that, but that's much more rare. And then very, very rarely, uh, thyrotoxicosis can cause uh, um, delirium, where you're, you're thought you're consciousness goes in and out, you're, you're awake, you're asleep, you're, you're not quite attending to things, but that's an exceedingly rare kind of phenomenon. There's been a lot of talk about the eye findings in Graves' disease throughout this conference. Uh, you know about the eye complications, and they can add an emotional burden to people. And there have been studies uh, looking at people with Graves' disease with and without eye findings, uh, and, and they find that the people who have eye findings often have higher rates of emotional problems. They're more um, self-conscious, self they have more trouble perhaps going out in public, uh, and that gives them a secondary uh, burden of, of emotional um, abnormalities. So here's that study. There are 24 patients with Graves' disease, uh, 24 with eye findings, 24 without, and those with the eye findings had greater emotional distress uh, and they had uh, were more distressed than people without the physical signs. So that's an added kind of a burden. The treatment of Graves' disease in relation to the emotional symptoms, okay? So that the, the sort of bad news, or it's not terrible news, but it's often delayed, okay? And the delay occurs because people, like myself, so I, I, although, so, and it, this occurred at a period of my life when I was going all over the country teaching other physicians about recognizing anxiety disorders. We had done a lot of work on anxiety disorders, and the anxiety disorders almost always present with physical symptoms of, of rapid heart rate, of, of um, shakiness, of jitteriness, of irritability, and I thought how ironic that I, of all people, developed an anxiety disorder. You know, cause I go, and and I, I didn't think about Graves' disease, although I knew about it. Um, it was, again, it was my wife who said maybe there's something else that, that's going on. So there's a delay in seeking treatment. And finding the right dose may take some time, as was discussed uh, throughout the conference. And so you may have residual symptoms until the right dose is found. The good news is, though, for the vast majority of people, finding the right dose of antithyroid medication or radioactive iodine, getting on thyroid replacement, most of the time, not all, most of the time, takes care of the vast majority of the symptoms that you all talked about and that were shown on the slide. So for the most part, no additional psychiatric medicine or psychiatric treatment is needed. That's not for everybody, but I think that's more the, the rule than the exception. Um, when they persist, and I'll, that's sort of the next slide, uh, that, that's sort of the question of how to understand the persistence. And, and one of the things that, that was shown uh, with the discussion with pediatric is the use of beta blockers. Um, and 
So again, many of the symptoms that we talked about, rapid heart rate, being irritable, shaky, heat intolerance, they're really physical symptoms, peripheral. They're not part of the brain. And so these beta blocker medications actually block the receptors that are responsible for these symptoms. So in my own case, within a day or two of the diagnosis, when I was on beta blockers, many of those things were taken care of. Heart rate went down, jitteriness went down, sweating went down, and there was an enormous relief. Now the beta blocker medication itself doesn't even go into the brain. So it's not that your quote unquote anxiety is being treated, it's really that the manifestations are being blocked in the body at the, what we call the periphery. So again, some of these manifestations don't need specific psychiatric treatment. Now what about after remission? So you, you've got the diagnosis, you've been treated, you're feeling okay, but still things persist. What do you do then? Well, one possibility is you wait a little bit longer. So maybe your body just needs a little bit more time to re-equilibrate and, and that you really will wind up feeling well after a while. Another possibility is that maybe you've had a depression earlier in your life and the stress of having a medical illness has brought that one back. And so the thyroid disease, say, is treated, but the depression that you had five years ago is now in a second, in a recurrence. And so you have a, a major depression that may need to be treated or an anxiety disorder. Uh, and so that takes care of sort of the next two bullets. And if that's the case, you're treated, your thyroid's okay, your endocrinologist, a primary care doctor says you're, you should be fine and you're not fine, then it may be wise to seek either further medical evaluation, is the thyroid being treated as well as it can be, and or mental health treatment. Maybe you do have a secondary kind of a problem that could result, that could benefit from treatment. And the typical psychiatric disorders that either are confused with Graves or can be precipitated by are the vast group that we call anxiety disorders, and I'll explain this in a minute, the mood disorders, which usually is depression, or maybe bipolar disorder, what we'll call manic depressive disorder, adjustment disorders. We have this category of, dis of disorders called adjustment disorders in psychiatry, which are a bunch of symptoms that are clearly in response to an identified stressor. And the stressor may be medical illness, the stressor may be a divorce, the stressor may be a financial uh, setback. But if somebody has a medical illness and as a result of that, they respond with a lot of anxiety or they respond with a lot of depression, that we might call an adjustment disorder. And there may be some specific kinds of treatments for that. Exceedingly rare, very rare, almost not worth talking about, but I wanted to include it. These can become psychotic disorders where people sort of lose touch with reality and they may hear voices or see things. But it, it, that is so rare that, that, it, that most, most clinicians rarely see that. And true cognitive disorders, what I was talking about before, are also rare. Now, it's hard to do these studies when people say, well, what's the, are there higher rates of all these disorders in people with Graves' disease? And the answer is probably yes, but because of the difficulty of diagnosing these disorders in the face of a medical illness, these numbers have to be taken a little bit with a, a grain of iodized salt. <laughs> So depression may be increased, up to a third pe of people may have de um, depression. Mania or bipolar disorder, much less. A, f a significant number of people will meet the criteria for panic disorder or other anxiety disorders. Again, once the, disease, the thyroid disease is under control, mm -hmm. most of these disorders disappear. So what I want to do now, and I, I'll take a little bit of a break in case anybody has questions, but what I'm going to do now is sort of move on to anxiety disorders and mood disorders, giving you sort of the criteria for the true psychiatric disorder, and, and sort of hoping that, that that will help put it into perspective, that many of the symptoms that people have don't really meet these full criteria for psychiatric disorders. But is there any, anybody have any questions uh, up until now? Yes. My, my buddy has come back. So subclinical hyperthyroidism. And specifically, the I, I didn't catch the, the, the 
Did you mean subclinical hyperthyroidism in relation to our to the emotional symptoms? Was yes, there, and, or any relationship. I'm not sure what subclinical hyperthyroidism is. So, so I would I would define subclinical hyperthyroidism as the kind of of biochemical numbers where the TSH was suppressed to a variable extent, but the T4 and T3 numbers remain within the normal range. So that would tell me that, that the hypothalamic pituitary axis in the base of the brain was sensing concentrations of thyroid hormone which were excessive, but the excess was only marginal, not great enough to cause an excursion of T4 and T3 levels to, to be, be elevated above the normative range. But remember, this, this I think, precisely points to the, the inadequacy of the parameters that we use in clinical medicine. The, the normative, the normal range of all of these tests that we use to diagnose hypo, euthyroidism, hyperthyroidism, they're wide ranges. They're, they're wide ranges because they reflect the biological variations among a large number of individuals. So really, what we want to know for a given individual is what was her TSH before she got brain disease? What was her T3 level? What was her T4 level? But I, in more in, in, to the point of your question, at least as I understand it, is do, do subtle changes, variations in thyroid hormone level that might, might be consistent with subclinical hyperthyroidism, do they have emotional consequences? Okay, and, and, and so let me, let me talk about that for a second, because what, there are some data that people who have depression, particularly women with depression, have a higher prevalence of what your and Terry has just defined as subclinical hyperthyroidism. Okay, I, but similarly, many women or many people who have depression will actually have subclinical hypothyroidism. So hypothyroid states are usually more related to depression than is hyperthyroid. Hyperthyroid tends to have more of the irritability, the, the anxiety, now, and those can overlap, but, but subclinical hypothyroidism is not uncommonly seen in people who we treat for depression. And actually, as a total sidelight, one of the additional treatments for depression that doesn't respond mm -hmm. to normal kinds of antidepressants is the addition of thyroid hormone. Endocrinologists hate when we do that, uh, but, but when we treat what we call treatment-resistant depression, we often treat it with additional thyroid hormone, even when somebody is, has normal thyroid numbers. Okay. okay, so let me go on. I'm going to talk first about anxiety disorders, then I'm going to talk about mood disorders. So as you see from this slide, and I'll define some of these terms in a little bit, but if you look at the bottom line, this is this is the general population. So people went out and queried, you know, 10,000 people, 20,000 people in a huge study. Have you ever had this, this constellation of symptoms or this group of symptoms? And for people with an anxiety disorder, almost a third, 28, 30% of the general population at some point in their life met criteria for either panic disorder or agoraphobia or any of these kinds of things. So a panic attack is 
a very specific event. It's when you're minding your own business, you're sitting there, you're quiet, you're driving in the car, you're reading the newspaper, and boom, this thing comes on. Your heart starts going a mile a minute, you get dizzy, you start to sweat, you can have a hard time catching your breath, you feel unsteady, you feel the world around you is spinning perhaps, and you often think that, that something horrible is happening, that you're going to die, you're going to have, um, you're going to pass out, you're going to be, you're going to go crazy. People who have panic attacks really feel extraordinarily frightened. And they usually last minutes, seconds, minutes. They don't last days, they don't last weeks. If they last weeks, then there's, it's something other than a panic attack. So it's a very specific kind of an event. And these are the typical symptoms that people talk about of having panic. And, then, and if you look, what I've, what I've put in the red, you, you can see they're the same symptoms that we talked about when people have thyroid disease. Okay, so it's rapid heart rate, palpitations, trembling or shaking, sweating, shortness of breath, numbness and tingling, chills, hot flash. They're virtually the same symptoms. And this is what I've been trying to say, that it makes it very difficult to distinguish symptoms related to thyroid disease from a psychiatric illness. And so you sometimes have to treat the thyroid disease and see if it all goes away, and then you have a better shot at knowing that it was related to the thyroid and not an independent psychiatric illness. If you thought of it the other way, if somebody came to me with first-time anxiety and these panic symptoms, and I didn't get thyroid hormones, which I do because I'm sensitized to that, and I said, oh sure, this is panic disorder, and treated them with panic disorder medications, they would not get better. Because the panic is not the reason that they're feeling that way. It's the thyroid disease. And so you, you always want to look, and that's not just thyroid disease. Any psychiatric illness that we're treating for the first time, we should, mental health professionals should, make sure that the person does not have a medical illness that could explain the symptoms. So you may need laboratory tests, you may need to see a primary care doctor first. Now one of the, so these people have panic attacks, and then one of the great problems with people who have panic attacks is they become so frightened of having more panic attacks that they begin to have, do less activity, they begin to constrict their behavior because they don't want to have a panic attack in a public place. And so you can get the, the, uh, what, what, the, what we call agoraphobia. So this is a meeting of the Agoraphobic Society. There are four people in the audience, and they say it's a good turnout. Okay? Uh, and this can be a very, very, I mean, aside from this sort of a joke, but it can be a very devastating illness that people may not want to leave home. They may not drive in their car. They may not be able to take care of their home responsibilities, taking the kids' places, going to work doing the shopping, then may not go to a grocery store, because what if I have a panic attack when I'm in the middle of an aisle? May not go to the movies, or if you go to the movies, you sit on the end seat way in the back so you can get out. May not go to a restaurant because you'd be embarrassed. So th these are not inconsequential um, uh, consequences of panic. So that's panic. Then there's something, it's sort of a, even in psychiatry we call it sort of a wastebasket category. It's called generalized anxiety disorder. This is the symptom list. And again, look at the, what's in red. Same exact things we talked about as related to thyroid disease. Now, to make a diagnosis of GAD, what we call generalized anxiety disorder, number one, you have to have exceeding amounts of worry. So people have to worry about virtually everything. They worry about their, not only their health, they worry about their family, they worry about their finances. Even when other family members say, there's nothing to worry about. You know, we're, we're financially fine, yet they continue to worry. The kids are fine, and they continue to worry. And you have all these symptoms, and it lasts over six months continuously, and it interferes with your behavior. So we make it sort of harder to make this diagnosis because it's so nonspecific. I mean, there are people who have it, but it's, it, it often doesn't occur by itself. It occurs with something else. So that's GAD. Then there's something called social anxiety disorder, or what used to be called social phobia. You may see this. This is described on TV where like pharmaceutical companies are trying to sell drugs to treat this. But, but what it is is sort of a, being concerned, being fearful of having other people watch what you do. And I'm not talking about being paranoid. I'm talking about 
here. So if I had a big social anxiety disorder, I wouldn't be up here. I couldn't stand all of you watching it, watching me. And indeed, public speaking is probably the number one phobia that people have. Now, many people don't have to do public speaking, so it's not a big deal. But if you ask people what would give them tremendous anxiety, you give them a list of phobias, public speaking is almost always at the top of the list. Now, there are other kind of, of social anxiety sort of symptoms, people who won't eat in front of other people, people who won't write in front of other people. And you could just think about, again, in your daily life, how many times you have to do that. You have to write, you have to sign checks. I used to say you have to go to the post office. You know, nobody does that anymore, but you, know, you, do, you do write in front of people in various ways. So social anxiety disorder, particularly people who have some of the eye findings and who are somewhat embarrassed about appearing in public, it can be confused with social anxiety disorder. Now, the treatment of anxiety disorders is not terribly complicated. It's, it's usually highly successful. Um, what you need to do is make I have to think. Yeah, think. Uh, you make sure that of what the anxiety disorder is, because some of them have somewhat specific treatments. There are other anxiety disorders that I didn't talk about because they're not specifically related to thyroid disease. Post-traumatic stress disorder is one, obsessive compulsive disorder, but they're not really related in the way I'm talking about. The treatments may include medication, and there are two major classes of medication. One are very specific anti-anxiety medications, what we tend to call benzodiazepines, drugs like Valium, Ativan, uh, Xanax, which work wonderfully well on the anxiety, work very quickly. Nothing better to get somebody calm in a half hour than one of these drugs. Very good. The problem with them is that over time, people can become dependent upon them. And, and that has to be managed. So if you're on it, you're on a, a significant dose for a period of time, you can't stop it abruptly, or you'll have a true withdrawal syndrome. So they're not, to be, they're not to be used lightly, but they can be very effective. The other major class of medicines we use to treat virtually all the anxiety disorders are the antidepressants, even if you're not depressed. So, you know, you could, if you believe in a higher power, God or whatever, whoever decided that antidepressants would work on anxiety and depression did a good job because many times people have both. And you do one medicine, it takes care of both. So the antidepressants can be used. And I'm happy to talk about that in a little bit more detail if anybody asks. But just as important, and, and from my point of thinking, and I give a lot of these drugs, is to try and deal with these problems through psychotherapy. And the most specific psychotherapy for anxiety so disorders is something we call cognitive behavior therapy, or CBT. And what CBT really does, it takes the stance that the reason that you're feeling so lousy is because you're thinking in a certain way, and your thoughts are what fuel your feelings. Now, you've got to think about that for a second, because most of the time we think we're feeling something, and then our thoughts follow how lousy we're feeling. But in cognitive therapy, it's the other way around. So if you're feeling scared, you're then going to, I mean, excuse me, if you're thinking scary thoughts, oh my god, I'm going to have a heart attack, oh, this is the worst thing, oh, my family will be, you know, without me, what happens is you then start to feel as if that's already happened. Your adrenaline kicks up, you start to feel worse, and then as you feel worse, you then say, you see, I knew I was going to die. So, this is the exact thing that happens if somebody has a panic attack. So somebody has a symptom. Say their first symptom of panic is they, they realize their heart has just skipped a beat and picked up a little bit of speed. Their immediate thought is, uh-oh, oh, I think I'm going to have a heart attack. And as soon as you think that, your adrenaline kicks out, your heart rate increases more, you miss another beat, and then you say, see, I knew it. And, I, oh, I'm not going to make it to the hospital, and my kids, and my this, and it just... Okay, and so what cognitive behavior therapy tries to do is interrupt that train of thought. Stop it from what we call catastrophic thinking. You think one thought, that leads to another thought. Oh, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to be in the hospital, then I'm going to lose my job, my family's going to be bereft, we'll, be, we'll lose the house, we'll become homeless, all this kind of stuff. And all it was was a, a, a skipped beat. Okay, that's catastrophic thinking. So, 
what CBT does is it works on that. It works on misinterpretations. Oh, I always, nobody likes me. Everybody hates me. That's a typical one for somebody who's depressed. You know, and of course that's not true. So the cognitive therapist will say, let's, you told me last week you went out with so-and-so. Well, that was just, no, well, no. How could everybody hate you if you have friends? You know, so you, you stop and you make them re-look at their thinking. And as hokey as that sounds, it is exceedingly powerful. So CBT is a treatment of choice for almost all the anxiety disorders as well as for depression. And it can be used with medicine. And in, ser in serious cases, studies show that a combination of medications, say antidepressants, and, and cognitive therapy is probably more powerful than either one alone, but not always necessary to do both. Let's switch to depression for a second. So the first thing is point prevalence. That means right now. So if we look in this room, there's 100 people in the room, about 5% will have a significant depression as we speak. If you look at lifetime prevalence, it, it jumps up into the mid-teens. More in women than in men, everywhere it's always been studied. In the United States, in developing countries, there's more women who are depressed than men. Maybe it's sociocultural, maybe it's hormonal, maybe it's something else, but those data are pretty good. And depression in and of itself is a recurrent illness. That means it comes and it goes. So if you have one episode of depression, say you're 25 years old, you have your first episode, gets treated or it goes away on its own, you got a 50-50 chance of having a second episode sometime later in your life. Okay, so if you're treated with medicine, we often say, well, should I stay on? Should I go off? Well, it depends if you're a betting man or woman. You want to bet that you'll have another one and you're, you don't want to do it, you stay on. But 50-50 is not bad. Maybe I'll go off and see what happens. If you have two separate episodes, your chance of having a third one increases to 70%. If you have three separate episodes, then it's likely without staying on treatment, you'll have a fourth 90% of the time. So the more single episodes one has, the more likely it is to have a further episode, and that translates into treatment and perhaps staying on antidepressant medication, which treat prophylactically. It not only treats the, the illness at the time, but it prevents further episodes. So these are the criteria for depression. So you got to be depressed. This word anhedonia means a loss of pleasure in your usual activities. So depressed people either say they're sad, or if they're not acknowledging that, just say, well, I don't, I don't like doing anything. I don't get any pleasure in activities. Um, and you have to have that kind of depression, plus at least five of these other symptoms. And the whole shebang has to last two weeks, most of the day, most of the time. And it can't be related to bereavement, because many of these symptoms occur when somebody has lost a loved one. And you don't want to make that an illness. You don't want to call that a depression when somebody's grieving. But again, if you look at the list, so insomnia or hypersomnia means sleep disturbance. Anorexia or hyperphasia means uh, appetite disturbance or weight loss. Uh, psychomotor agitation, at fidgety, having trouble sitting still, or psychomotor retardation, being slowed down, slow speech, slow thinking, fatigue, decreased concentration, exactly the same symptoms again as we talked about earlier. And so again, it is very important to try and parse out, is it the thyroid disease? Treat it. If these symptoms persist, then it may be a depression. Don't rush to treat this as a psychiatric disorder unless the thyroid is felt to be euthymic. In bipolar disorder, or what used to be called manic depression, it's sort of the opposite. When we diagnose people with bipolar disorder, they usually have had a depressive episode sometime and a manic or what we call a hypomanic or almost full manic at another time. The major symptoms of mania are, again, trouble sleeping. People sleep two, three hours, and they feel OK. They don't feel terribly tired, more talkative than usual, racing thoughts, trouble getting the words out as fast as their thinking is, uh, distractibility. Uh, they're into this, and then they're into this. Irritability. Uh, they become very irritable if you're manic. And you do more things than you usually do. Again, not all that dissimilar to some people who are hyperthyroid. 
Um, and so again, you take a history, you look if there have been previous depressive episodes, but you sort of want to keep that in mind. This is a guy with the pharmacist. He says, it's a new antidepressant. Instead of swallowing it, you throw it at anybody who appears to be having a good time. <laughs> And the reality is we need new antidepressants. And so we've had the same kind of antidepressants for 20 years. You know, we have a couple of what we call Me Too drugs. And the antidepressants are wonderful. They, they work well, but they only work, oh, a third to 40% of the time to get people truly, truly well into what we call remission. You can get people better, but to really get them fully well, first drug off the shelf, it often only works at 40%. So there are ways of doing more combinations and then there's adding psychotherapy as well. So the thyroid disease may be what, what I call unmasked. It may, it may unmask a vulnerability for depression. We think depression, like most psychiatric illnesses, have some kind of a genetic component. The genetic component may be the vulnerability to have the disorder. And if your life circumstances are favorable and you're going along and everything's okay, you may not have the depression manifest itself. However, if you have a major stressor, again, it could be a life stressor, a divorce, you know, an illness in your children, a loss of a job, a medical illness, the illness itself can precipitate a previously un unseen depression. Okay, so that can unmask it. And if the symptoms are severe enough, independent of the thyroid disease, thyroid disease again is taken care of, then you think about treatment and the treatment is antidepressants and again CBT. If there is a depression, one always must be concerned about somebody who has suicidal thinking or suicidal behavior. And this is very, very serious. So that 80% of people who ultimately commit suicide have a mood disorder, have either a depression or bipolar disorder. And any evaluation of somebody who's depressed needs to include an assessment of suicidal thinking, suicidal intent, suicidal behavior. Even if it's due to a thyroid disease, anybody who has depressed mood needs to be queried by a professional, not necessarily by a loved one, but by a professional about this. And, and again, uh, this, this is the, clearly the most severe, if you want to call it, complication or result of psychiatric illness is for somebody to kill themselves. So now the question is, what, do you ex what should you expect from your practitioner? So the woman says to the doctor, I think the doses need adjusting. I'm not nearly as, as happy as people in the ads. <laughs> what is it that you should expect? Well, you should expect clear and reliable information from the healthcare team. I mean, the last series of questions at lunch that Terry was answering, medicine has changed. The time that primary care physicians or, or primary care extenders spend with patients is reduced. And that's a problem. It's a problem for patients. And so you try to get as much information. Somebody said that communication's the key, and I, I couldn't agree with that more. Uh, so that's a mainstay. There's a lot of information on the web, much of it good, some of it not so good. It's hard to distinguish between the two, but there are wonderful websites. Um, I think some of the materials that you got showed websites. The Graves Disease Foundation, obviously, itself has a wealth of information. It's good to be armed with information, but again, one needs to try and, and, and balance the kind of information you get from the web. And then, Dr. Smith, can you see this picture? So this is, uh, this is steps to wellness. I couldn't think of a better wellness picture than to have Dr. Smith and Dr. Douglas here. So that, that's, my, that's my key to wellness. So wellness in, in general, okay? Forget about all the symptoms we talked about. It's important to pay attention to wellness. And probably the single best thing to keep people well is to be connected to other people. Connected to your family, connected to social groups, connected to religious groups, if that's what's important, or ecology groups or something. People who support other people do better. Every study has shown that no matter what the medical illness or the psychiatric illness you have, is if you have people in your life, you do better. So I, I can't stress that enough. Spiritual, religious beliefs, being part of organized religion or, or non-organized religion, again, is protective against a lot of these things. 
address interpersonal conflicts. Medical illnesses can really lead to disruptions in families. That could be medical illnesses, it could be psychiatric illnesses, a spouse may not understand what you're going through and may wonder why you look fine, why can't you do X? It's true a great deal when we deal with patients with agoraphobia because somebody looks fine and they say, I can't go to the supermarket. And the, the spouse says, what do you mean you can't go to the supermarket? You know, I, I can't take the kids in the car. What do you mean you can't take, you know? So that the anger that that brings up, it can be enormous. Dealing with these kind of confl uh, conflicts. Exercise, diet, Meditation, yoga, tai chi, any of these things that just sort of keep people centered can be useful. There's some, a newish concept, although it's a newish word of a very old concept. It comes from Zen Buddhism. And you could sort of look this up. There's all sorts of websites about mindfulness. So mindfulness is just sort of a way that we talk about to pay attention to your own thoughts and your own body by slowing everything down, by taking a few minutes and just focusing inward and letting the world sort of go away from you and trying not to take your thoughts to the next step to the next step. Almost trying to not think, which obviously is not possible, but just trying to slow down, to center yourself. It's very similar to meditation for those of you who might meditate. And, and one of the terms that they use shown on the last bullet, it's cleaning house. That means your head. Just getting rid of some of the dysfunctional thoughts and slowing it down uh, in a form of meditation. And there are some exercises that, that are either group-led or individual-led. You might look on some of these websites, uh, and that might find that useful. So in conclusion, um, Graves' disease, is, as you all know much better than I do, can be associated with, with emotional symptoms, with cognitive symptoms to a certain extent. They usually result because of the thyroid hormone abnormalities. And if you treat the thyroid hormone abnormalities, most of the symptoms can go away. That's the very good news. For some people, these emotional or, or cognitive symptoms may persist. It may be that you have uncovered a previous vulnerability to a disease or the disease just sort of persisted in a new form of a new anxiety disorder, a new depression, uh, and that can be treated. Um, Final bullet, although it is a chronic illness, and you've heard that all through the day, uh, most people do well, and, and hope should always be maintained because there are ways of treating almost all of the things we've talked about today. So that's it. Thank you for your attention, and I'm happy to answer any questions. <laughs>